Welcome wrestling enthusiasts and connoisseurs as we embark on a riveting exploration into the tumultuous terrain of the TNA iceberg. Join us as we dissect the layers of challenges, controversies and pivotal moments that have led to the decline of this once thriving promotion. From backstage turmoil to financial woes, we'll navigate the treacherous waters that ultimately contributed to TNA's downfall. Whether you're a seasoned fan or just curious about the industry's ebbs and flows, this video is your ticket to understanding the intricate layers of TNA. This is the TNA Iceberg. And we're starting off at the top of the iceberg, Tier 6, with our first entry being none other than Sting vs Jeff Hardy at TNA's Victory Road 2011. Sting and Jeff Hardy's match at Victory Road 2011 was a major blow to TNA's already shaky reputation. Additionally, the fans who bought the pay-per-view as well as those actually in attendance were completely ripped off and deprived of a proper main event. The story is well known by now. Hardy showed up in no condition to wrestle, as Hardy was in a drug adult state, but was sent out to work a match anyway. Heel authority figure Eric Bischoff got in Sting's face prior to the opening bell, actually in order to relay information about the new finish of the match, and things got underway with Hardy barely being able to stand. After a few seconds of posturing, Jeff was finally able to lock up with the veteran, who almost immediately hit him with a scorpion death drop and held his shoulders down for a three count. Sting grabbed his belt and left to a chorus of boos and amid chants of BS by the fans, Sting very audibly yelled, I agree, to a group of fans in the front row. It was an incredibly unprofessional situation, almost a relic of wrestling shady carnival past, and something completely unthinkable in the modern era. And up next we have Tessa Blanchard. Tessa Blanchard was one of the most promising young talents in the wrestling industry in the late 2010s. She seemed destined for greatness, and it seemed like it was only a matter of time before AEW or WWE would sign her. She was making a name for herself in intergender matches in TNA slash Impact Wrestling and was on course to become the first ever woman to hold the men's world championship of a major US wrestling promotion. But then just one day before she faced off against Sammy Callahan at Samiversary for the title, she tweeted something that will alter her career forever. Blanchard posted a tweet urging women to support each other. This triggered a wave of backlash and accusatory tweets from prominent female voices in the wrestling industry. There were multiple accusations of bullying, but the most notable accusation was when Tessa was accused of spitting in a black woman's face in Japan and using racial slurs against her. Many other wrestlers who were in Japan and saw this incident corroborated the story. Blanchard denied these accusations and no concrete evidence was presented against her. However, the damage was done and her wrestling career started to decline. Tessa Blanchard managed to overcome the storm and achieve a historic milestone in women's wrestling by defeating Sammy Callahan to win the Men's World Championship. However, her triumph was short-lived as the pandemic struck, causing a global shutdown. Despite being the reigning champion, Blanchard did not make appearances on Impact TV during this time. On top of not being able to appear on TV, she failed to submit her promos for a taped segment and TNA lost confidence in her and requested that she relinquish the title. However, Tesla refused to do this and consequently, in June of 2020, TNA decided to terminate Blanchard's contract and she has not returned to a major US promotion since. And up next we have Perk Angle. Perk Angle refers to Kurt Angle's run in TNA, where he was often perked up to deal with ongoing injuries. This era of Kurt Angle was legendary, as he regularly did stage dives, moonsaults off cages and had little regard for his health. Kurt was dealing with major pill addiction and he had nothing to lose so he put his life into his performances. He was at such a rock bottom that he didn't care about getting hurt because the pills could take away his pain and so he had no reason to fear pain. At the height of his addiction, he was taking 65 extra strength Vicodin a day and because there was such a prominent drinking culture in TNA, he started mixing alcohol with his meds. Kurt was going through a lot in this time because his wife divorced him in order to be with Jeff Jarrett in real life and they even made this into a storyline. On the tail end of Perk Angle's run, he lost a lot of weight but he was still a resting machine. Throughout the years of Perk Angle, he managed to get 4 DUIs and the last DUI that he got in Texas in 2013 convinced him to finally check himself into rehab to get to the root of the problem. He went for a 30 day stay in rehab and since then he is clean and healthy. And up next we have CM Punk. Whether you love him or hate him, there's no doubt that CM Punk is one of the biggest stars in the history of wrestling. After building up a solid fanbase for himself in the independent circuit, Punk would get his chance in WWE in the mid 2000s, but before Punk was in WWE, he was in TNA as early as 2002, and his run with the company would last until March of 2004. CM Punk left TNA under controversial circumstances. In February of 2004, he would get involved in a physical scuffle with Teddy Hart outside of a restaurant. Around this time, he would stop appearing for TNA shows as well, and all of this caused TNA to stop booking Punk anymore. 
And up next, we have the Monday Night Wars. Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan debuted in TNA on the January 4th, 2010 edition of TNA Impact, and them joining the company signaled big changes as they basically ran the show backstage. Hogan and Bischoff pushed for TNA to move to Mondays to compete with WWE Raw. Their first show on January 4 went head to head with WWE Raw, and even though TNA lost the first night of the Monday Night Wars, it was a rating success for them with almost 3 million viewers tuning in for Hulk Hogan's segment. Despite this promising start, it was a complete disaster and they got absolutely slaughtered in the ratings for the next few weeks, getting worse ratings that they would get in their normal Thursday time slot. TNA also decided to start touring for the Monday Night Wars, but this ended up terribly because they were renting arenas that were too big and not filling them up, thus destroying them financially. TNA emphatically lost the Monday Night War with WWE, and they returned to their Thursday night slot less than two months after the move. And up next, we have iconic promos. TNA has produced some of the most memorable promos and segments in wrestling history, and two of these segments stand out above the rest. The first one being the Scott Steiner math promo, where he mathematically explained statistics and probability of him defeating his opponents. It made absolutely no sense and it was hilarious. Many people still talk about this promo to this day. The other segment that is iconic is the woo-off between Jay Lethal and Ric Flair. This segment saw Jay Lethal impersonating Flair and the two went on to woo at each other in an hilarious manner. What makes this promo even better was that it was completely unscripted. And up next we have Black Rain. In 2007, Dustin Rhodes was with TNA as Black Rain. By then, his career had fizzled out and he was nowhere near the star that he had been during his peak as Goldust in the Attitude Era. Black Rain was basically a much darker version of Goldust. He painted himself in black and silver and wore full body attire of the same color. But he was boring because he kept on having gimmick match after gimmick match. Monsters Ball, Capture the Rat, Cuffed in a Cage, Match of 10,000 Tacks, and Shop of Horrors are just some of the gimmick matches that Black Rain was involved in during his run in TNA. Perhaps it had become clear from early on that he was not in the condition to have great in-ring matches, and as a result, the company decided to rely on these stipulations. It seemed like TNA had completely given up on Black Rain towards the end of his run in the company, and inevitably, soon enough, he was released from TNA. And up next, we have the Reverse Battle Royale. This concept, which was conveniently invented during one of Vince Russo's stints as TNA's creative chief, is still one of the most ill thought out in wrestling history. The reverse battle royale involves the competitors all fighting to get into the ring. Yes, TNA created a match largely consisting of 16 men brawling on the outside, trying to make an incredibly straightforward task seem difficult. Once half of the 16 competitors have made their way bravely into the ring, they're tasked with throwing the remaining competitors back out again. As if this wasn't convoluted enough, the final two men compete in a straight singles match to determine the winner. It makes for a bizarre sequence of events, and an idea which should have never been able to see the light of day. And up next we have Okada in TNA. Kazuchika Okada is undoubtedly one of the best and most decorated wrestlers in the world. He will likely go down as one of the greatest wrestlers of all time once he hangs up his boots. In 2010, after he had graduated from New Japan Pro Wrestling's Young Lion system, he debuted in TNA. In TNA, Okada had an infamously disastrous run, not through fault of his own, however. TNA simply did not know what to do with him and he was made into a jobber. He was also given a god awful gimmick and a look that was inspired by Kato from the Green Hornet, and Okada was renamed Okato. TNA clearly fumbled the bag when it came to Okada, as he looked like a joke in the company. His last appearance for the promotion was in June of 2011. Afterwards, he went on to become the Rainmaker and rose to the top of Japanese wrestling. And up next, we have Joey Ryan. Joey Ryan was one of the most popular and controversial wrestlers from Impact slash TNA and the Independents. His time in Impact would end quickly during the Speaking Out movement in 2020. Joey Ryan had 18 different accusations against his name from 16 different women and two men for things like SA, grape, and harassment. One of these accusations were him flirting with a minor, and later on, Joey himself confirmed that that accusation was true. After these allegations came out, he posted an hour-long explanation going through each accusation, and he denied almost every single accusation toward him. Because of these allegations, Impact fired him, but Joey responded to his firing by suing Impact for $10 million for breach of contract. This lawsuit ended up going nowhere though, as Joey dropped the lawsuit and he retired from professional wrestling. He actually got a job at Disneyland, but was fired when fans told Disney about his past. And now we're moving down the iceberg into Tier 5, with our first entry on Tier 5 being Kevin Nash and Samoa Joe Incident. 
One backstage altercation that made headlines occurred in 2007 within the ranks of TNA. This incident pitted a then relatively unknown Samoa Joe against the industry giant Kevin Nash. It all began with an explosive on-screen incident during TNA's Turning Point event. On that memorable night, Samoa Joe delivered a promo that sent shockwaves throughout the wrestling world. Joe's target was Scott Hall, a wrestling legend and close associate of Kevin Nash. Hall, who was scheduled to appear at the event, was conspicuously absent due to a medical issue. What followed was a verbal tirade by Joe that seemed to blur the lines between scripted entertainment and reality. Samoa Joe's promo is remembered as a shoot promo. In this case, Joe's impassioned diatribe aimed to tarnish Scott Hall's reputation. To Nash, this event went beyond wrestling storytelling. It was a personal affront to his close friend, Scott Hall. Nash felt that Samoa Joe had gone too far, and unable to contain his frustration, Kevin Nash confronted Samoa Joe face to face in the backstage area, slapping him twice in the face while Samoa Joe did nothing out of respect for Nash. And up next we have Jordan Grace Roids. Jordan Grace is one of the most prominent women's wrestlers in TNA today, and she's a three-time Knockouts World Champion. However, during late 2022 and early 2023, her body underwent a significant change in about six months. She packed on significant muscle whilst losing a considerable amount of weight in such a quick time. The reason for this is because she got into professional powerlifting and bodybuilding, two industries that are notoriously known for their rampant juicing. This led to fans speculating that Jordan Grace is on the good juice. What doesn't help Jordan Grace's case is a significant change to her voice. I used to love them and then I started getting hurt. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying I don't like them anymore, but... Unless you've been living under a rock, you probably already know that UFC 289 is returning to Canada, and the women are headlining. And up next, we have the last rights match. Not all gimmick matches can be winners. Unfortunately, when Vince Russo is around, they rarely ever are. TNA's last rights match at Destination X 2007 between Sting and Abyss was one of those occasions. So, what is a last rights match, you ask? That's a good question, and a question many were asking at Destination X, as TNA didn't bother to explain the rules before the pay-per-view. It was basically a casket match, but instead of the casket being at ringside, the casket, which they call the deathbed, gets lowered from the ceiling when it's called for, then you put your opponent in the casket, and then the deathbed rises to the rafters and then you've won. Sting and Abyss made the most of this match, but this gimmick match just wasn't working, and by the end of it, fans were chanting, Fire Russo. This was the first time it happened and this chant would live on for many years to come whenever a match or segment was deemed too Russo-esque for the crowd. And up next we have John Moxley. Before he was known around the world for his work alongside Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns in The Shield or for his frequent breaking of the Muta scale, John Moxley was a trunks wearing, unscathed rapscallion whose idea of a good time was beating up helpless goobers and occasionally slamming them through panes of glass. He didn't quite achieve this in TNA, but he did better Lamar Braxton Porter prior to the 11 November 2008 TNA Impact Television tapings. The crowd audibly reacted for the future AEW World Champion too, with John Moxley having become a household independent star for his death-defying work in Combat Zone Wrestling. This match reportedly served as John Moxley's trial for him to join TNA on a permanent basis, but he was eventually nabbed by WWE Developmental. And up next we have Dixie Carter and Hulk Hogan. Around the time Hulk Hogan debuted in Impact Wrestling, they were getting a lot of bad press, with news regularly breaking of wrestlers being underpaid and numerous stars being frustrated with the state of the company, especially with Hogan's arrival. Responding to the low morale, Impact boss Dixie Carter held a big staff meeting where she basically gave them the old, my way or the highway speech, and she told them that if they didn't like the way things were being done in Impact, then they could leave. Bafflingly, Dixie aired the meeting on the following episode of Impact. This speech by Dixie gave fans a negative impression of her. Dixie would go hard for Hogan up until his run with the company ended. Hulk Hogan's contract with TNA ran out in 2013, with Hogan being written out of the show by having him quit on screen. While that sort of thing is common in wrestling shows, the execution was outrageous, with Hogan trying to leave up the entrance ramp while a desperate Dixie Carter held onto the Hulkster's legs, begging him to stay. Of course, Hogan denied her and dragged Dixie as he walked up the aisle. It was an embarrassing segment that was reportedly the result of Hulk Hogan's contractually mandated creative control. And up next, we have Ric Flair. The Nature Boy Ric Flair is one of the greatest wrestlers and box office attractions in wrestling history, but he meant absolutely nothing to TNA. In one of the biggest boneheaded decisions in wrestling, TNA had Ric Flair wrestle and didn't make a big deal out of it. 
One of TNA's initial mistakes with Ric Flair was pushing him as a heel when fans were wanting to cheer the living legend. Instead, he faced off against Hulk Hogan in a continuation of their never-ending feud that Hogan always wins. He then had several other matches that received very little hype from TNA. Flair's run with the company ended with him as a judge on Gut Check. It's still incredible that TNA could never figure out what to do with one of the most popular wrestlers of all time. And up next we have the Voodoo Kin Mafia. The New Age Outlaws Billy Gunn and Road Dogg were once members of Degeneration X. They wrestled in TNA as BG and Kip James and were billed as the Voodoo Kin Mafia. The Voodoo Kin Mafia's run started off pretty well but they soon started personifying TNA's unhealthy obsession with competing against WWE. In their promos, they vocally took credit for the popularity of DX. Perhaps worst of all, the name Voodoo Kin Mafia itself was, by all indications, explicitly contrived so that in acronym form, it would match Vincent Kennedy McMahon's initials, which is VKM. While it seemed clear the objective was to be edgy and call out WWE, the results felt forced and it felt like they were desperate for attention from a much larger wrestling company that justifiably felt no need to acknowledge them. The Voodoo Kin Mafia was TNA at its worst fighting outside its weight class when it took swings at WWE and failing to focus on their own company and their homegrown talent, and ultimately arriving at poor stories and matches. And next up we have the Electrified Cage Match. On paper, Team 3D vs LAX in a steel cage at Lockdown 2007 should have been an epic brawl. Instead, the gimmick was the cage was electrified. This being TNA, rather than actually trying to make it electrically charged, even to a safe minimum, they instead dimmed the lights to blue. The lights then flashed when someone was knocked into the cage and the wrestlers jerked around to pretend like they were being shocked with electricity. It was absolutely ludicrous and one felt embarrassed for the men doing it. Fans need to suspend their disbelief for professional wrestling, but this was far too much. And up next we have EV2. 2010 was the year that TNA started to become a retirement home for old wrestlers from past generations. The ECW locker room went to TNA but they weren't legally allowed to call themselves ECW so they went with the name EV2. A lot of the individual wrestlers also weren't allowed to use their actual names so they also had to change their names. They were given their own reunion pay-per-view Hardcore Justice 2010. The pay-per-view went mostly well but this caused TNA president Dixie Carter to give a lot of them exclusive contracts guaranteeing them money and places on the card. Their time in TNA didn't exactly go as planned, as their run was simply boring. TNA then began releasing members of the group slowly and that's how EV2 ended. And up next we have Booker T. In a sea of wrestlers who went from WWE to TNA, it was cool to see Booker T come aboard. They got a big name that could give the company some fresh matchups as well as help elevate younger talent. It was cool to see Booker T and TNA until his never ending feud with Robert Roode began. The two just didn't work together and it killed a lot of momentum that he had going. Later in his run, Booker turned heel and joined the entertaining main event mafia group. But even though the group had a lot of star power, it wasn't bringing in new viewers. And the thing with Booker T is that he looked like he didn't care in TNA and he was just there to collect the paycheck. He was overly goofy in his backstage promos and he wasn't bringing it in the ring. He then left after 3 years in the promotion. And now we're moving down the iceberg into the fourth tier, with our first entry on the fourth tier being Alberto Del Rio. Alberto Del Rio signed for WWE in 2008 and he became a multi-time world champion in that promotion. However, in 2017, he was with Impact Wrestling slash TNA under the ring name Alberto Al Patron. He became the double world champion for TNA as well as Global Force Wrestling. But in 2017, he was involved in an incident with WWE's Page. Del Rio was being investigated for an allegation of domestic violence that occurred at a Florida airport. A witness that saw the altercation said that Del Rio roughed up Paige. And because of this incident, he was suspended from Impact Wrestling and was stripped of his world titles. He eventually returned from his suspension, but when he came back, he claimed that everyone was a loser and a backstabber and had a generally sour attitude. He was eventually released from Impact in 2018 after legitimately no-showing the Lucha Underground vs Impact Wrestling event in New Orleans. And since then, his life has plummeted downhill. In May of 2020, he was arrested in Texas on one count of kidnapping and four counts of SA on his new girlfriend. And up next, we have Awesome Kong and Rebby Sky backstage fight. The wife of Matt Hardy, Rebby Sky, competed in Impact Wrestling and she was not always popular with her co-workers. One time Awesome Kong went off on Rebby Sky and things went way too far. 
The two women's wrestlers had beef, and backstage, according to many witnesses, Awesome Kong physically assaulted Sky by grabbing her around the neck. Security personnel intervened, restraining Kong and putting an end to the altercation. What makes this entire situation more distressing was the fact that Rebby and Matt Hardy's young son was present in proximity to the incident, adding an element of concern and potential danger to the situation. Because of all of this and other issues, Awesome Kong was released from TNA. And up next we have the Austin Aries and John Morrison incident. Austin Aries has a reputation for sometimes pushing the limit which can lead to heat with other wrestlers, fans and sometimes wrestling management. One of those times when he seemed to have gone a bit too far was when he left Impact Wrestling after losing the title to John Morrison who was known as Johnny Impact at the time. After their match, he bounced right up after getting pinned and no sold the finish. He then gave the middle finger to Don Callis on his way out of the arena. Many fans were curious if this was a work or a shoot, as it seemed like Ares was legitimately pissed off. Subsequently, Ares was released from Impact. And up next we have Samoa Joe's kidnapping. The unexpected end of an episode of TNA Impact in 2009 saw a despondent Samoa Joe leaving the arena after suffering a loss to Orlando Jordan. That's enough to put anyone in a bad mood, but it was about to get worse. After being almost taken out by a speeding white van, the former TNA World Heavyweight Champion would be attacked by a bunch of hooded men. These so-called ninjas grabbed Joe, threw him in the back of their vehicle and sped off into the night, quite literally to never be seen again. The general concept was to have Joe go away and then return as a psychopath heel character. But Vince Russo was behind this and there wasn't much thought put into who was behind the kidnapping and as the months spanned on, the idea of paying off the story became secondary to TNA's need for top baby faces. With a clear hole in the roster, Joe was sent back out to get some cheers like nothing had happened. And up next we have the blindfold cage match. Blindfold matches are never really a good idea, even in the best of circumstances. Ideally, they'd only take place as a filler match between two comedy jobbers, but TNA decided instead to save such a notorious stipulation for the big breakup feud of arguably their hottest tag team at the time, America's Most Wanted. Chris Harris and James Storm had been one of the most popular teams in the company's history. They stuck up the place in this plodding, monotonous blindfold match in a cage from lockdown 2007. As if this doesn't sound clunky enough, the two men hopelessly searched for each other around the ring and their blindfolds kept falling off and bringing the match to a halt. It was an atrocious bout, something the crowd realized within seconds, breaking into We Want Wrestling chants shortly after the opening bell. And up next we have Mr. Anderson. Mr. Kennedy made his name in WWE, but when he joined TNA, he changed his name to Mr. Anderson. A jump to TNA seemed like a big coup for the company at the time. He could have been one of their breakout stars and proved to WWE that it was a big mistake by letting him go. However, TNA then made its own mistake by giving him a flat debut when he took on Abyss. His arrogant loudmouth character just didn't translate that well as a good guy. That didn't stop TNA from trying multiple times though. Anderson had a couple short-lived world title runs but his character never truly caught on. He joined Aces and Eights but he was a side character in this faction and his full potential really wasn't realized in TNA. He then was fired from TNA in 2016 for failing an on-the-spot drug test at an Impact Wrestling taping. And up next we have the Old World Order. The New World Order is one of the greatest and most popular factions of all time and they ruled WCW with an iron fist in the late 90s. But when some of the members tried to recreate this group in 2010 in TNA, the magic was most certainly lost. The ship had already sailed as they were older, out of shape and now without a care in the world. They could not legally be called the NWO, so they went with the name The Band. They were doing the same old song and dance that got them famous, but they just weren't as captivating as before. They could barely go in the ring and they just couldn't work the way that they used to. And being much older men, they lost all of their cool factor. It was just painful to see these guys get together and rehash old memories by trying to be what they used to be. And up next we have the Aces and Eights. A motorcycle club terrorizing an entire wrestling company was a fresh concept that fans had not seen before. The group known as Aces and Ace in TNA had all the potential in the world to be something special for the long time second biggest wrestling company in North America. Unfortunately, a series of bad decisions and poor execution would follow the group. The chief complaint among wrestling fans is the decision to unveil Bully Ray as the group leader. From the moment Aces and Ace debuted in TNA, Bully had been their main target. That's why him being revealed as the leader didn't make sense. The next misstep in the history of the group was the underwhelming reveal of the rest of the club. It took much away from the excitement of who was behind the masks. 
In the end, despite Bully's success as arguably TNA's top heel, once he was unveiled to be the group's leader, the negatives far outweighed the positives for Aces and Eights. Unfortunately, the legacy of the group is being just another in a long line of missteps in the history of TNA. And up next we have Hard Justice 2006 Fire. Hard Justice 2006 began with Eric Young facing Johnny Devine. After a few minutes into the match, the cameras focused on the ceiling with smoke billowing about. It seemed some backstage pyro had accidentally ignited part of the ceiling, setting off the foam suppression systems and filling the ring with smoke. After chants of the roof, the roof, the roof is on fire, the crowd was escorted out of the impact zone. For half an hour, pay-per-view viewers were treated to everyone milling around the parking lot before the fire was brought under control. This was truly a bizarre opening to a show. And up next we have Rikishi. Rikishi was popular in WWE in the 90s and early 2000s. However, he left the company and debuted in TNA in September of 2007 as Junior for 2. His first two matches were pretty decent but then it all started going downhill from there. His interviews were a train wreck as he clearly felt that the company was beneath him. He only spent a little over a month in TNA. It was reported that he packed up his bags and left because he wanted a pay rise but TNA said no. And now we're moving down the iceberg into the third tier, with our first incident on the third tier being the Austin Aries and Christy Hem incident. Austin Aries is a name familiar with wrestling fans for his immense temper. This temper came out for all to see when announcer Christy Hem mistook him and Bobby Roode as Kaz and Christopher Daniels while announcing them to the ring. In heel fashion, Aries played into this, making Chrissy re-announce them while backed into a corner. Aries then climbed the ropes with Hem still there and his crotch was millimeters from Hem's face. Hem has spoken out against this, saying how uncomfortable it made her feel. Aries was fined $5,000 by Impact for this incident. And up next we have Charmel vs Jenna Moraska. This match was infamously awarded minus 5 stars by Dave Meltzer. Charmel vs Jenna Moraska has gone down in history as an exercise in how not to work a wrestling match. To be completely honest, the best thing about this match was Jenna Moraska's entrance. Although certainly not a legitimate professional wrestler, Charmel was made to look perfectly at home in the ring by the stunningly poor performance of Jenna Moraska, a reality star with precisely no wrestling experience. Moraska's offense consisted of potentially the most pathetic slaps ever seen in any form of entertainment. Thankfully, the match wasn't a long one, although it was still longer than it had any right to be, and ended with Maraska's Ali, Awesome Kong, easily destroying Charmel and allowing the former Survivor winner to pick up the win. She celebrated on Kong's shoulders, but dealt another unconvincing slap to the fan favorite for not holding her up there long enough. Kong then dragged her to the mat and hit her with a big body splash. Jenna somehow managed to make this look garbage too. And up next, we have New Jack. New Jack is one of the most notorious and controversial wrestlers of all time and is most known for his time in ECW. From jumping off high scaffolds night after night all the way to him trying to kill his opponents on several different occasions, New Jack has done it all. When ECW folded, WWE didn't want to hire him because they saw him as a disaster waiting to happen. The only option left was TNA. Not many people know that New Jack wrestled in TNA on several different occasions, but they were barely remembered. They hired former ECW wrestlers to create a faction. Raven led the group with names like Perry Saturn, The Sandman, and New Jack. New Jack would stop working for TNA shortly after the group had ended, but he returned years later. And up next we have Samoa Joe Machete. After one of the greatest runs in TNA history going unbeaten until he faced Kurt Angle, Samoa Joe took a break from TV. Upon his return, he had one of the worst gimmick changes of all time, as his character was tweaked slightly to play on his Samoan roots, wearing tribal face paint and carrying a machete. With this gimmick, he went to war with the Main Event Mafia. At Destination X, Main Event Mafia member Scott Steiner was scheduled to face Joe. Tierney shot an angle with Joe dragging Steiner backstage using the hooked blade. Joe appeared later in the promo, with him and the blade being covered in blood, saying that he took out Steiner. In a strange twist, Joe joined the main event Mafia at the next pay-per-view, handing Kurt Angle the title in the King of the Mountain match, rendering the whole angle pointless. And up next we have Bound for Glory Japan. Since 2005, the Bound for Glory pay-per-view has served as TNA's biggest show of the year, delivering huge matches and major climaxes to feuds. However, in 2014, TNA decides to do something different, delivering a co-promoted show with Japan's Wrestle 1 in Tokyo's Korokan Hall rather than in the States. While the result was a decent show, fans couldn't help but feel like it was a bit of a waste to experiment with TNA's WrestleMania, making it feel like it was something that wasn't bound for glory. And up next we have Abyss and Judas Messiah. 
long-time TNA fans will be familiar with the monster Abyss. A long-time TNA veteran, Abyss was at the height of his career in the mid-2000s and was even approached by WWE and was pitched a debut feud against none other than The Undertaker. Sadly, Abyss decided to stay in TNA. Abyss was wrestling Kurt Angle inside the sixth side of steel in a submission match, which Abyss lost after tapping out after his long-lost half-brother, Judas Messias, appeared through a hole in the ring and dragged Abyss back into the depths of Under the Ring. This storyline was clearly a ripoff of Kane's WWE debut, with Abyss and Judas Messias' father being James Mitchell, TNA's equivalent to Paul Bearer. Abyss eventually did defeat his half-brother in a barbed wire massacre match, but following this feud, Abyss became a friendlier babyface and even got himself a girlfriend. He went from TNA's resident monster to a joke. And up next we have the Feast or Fired match. The Feast or Fired concept was clearly an attempt by TNA to leech off of the success of WWE's Money in the Bank idea. Unfortunately, their attempt at replicating the stipulation led to one of the most baffling and illogical match types in pro wrestling history. The concept revolves around four briefcases, each on top of a pole stemming from each turnbuckle. The four lucky wrestlers who managed to retrieve one of the cases were open it to find one of the following. 1. A TNA World Heavyweight Championship shot. 2. A TNA Tag Team Championship shot, 3. A TNA X Division Championship shot, or 4. A pink slip, signifying the immediate termination of their contract. Yes, TNA introduced a match in which one of the winner's reward is being fired. The Feast of Fired match was an infuriatingly lazy piece of booking, sadly typical of TNA. And up next we have Mick Foley. Mick Foley is an absolute legend. He's a wrestler who has cemented his name in the history books for his extreme feats, but in 2009 while he was in TNA, the man could barely walk, let alone do so carrying an entire company on his back. He would hobble to the ring and try to put on the performances of yesteryear, but he was just too broken down to make it convincing. While his mind and heart were willing, his body would just not allow it. Despite this, TNA made him the world champion and this was just sad to see. His run as world champ wasn't particularly long or memorable, but just the fact that he was the top guy for a while was preposterous, considering the amount of younger and able talent at TNA's disposal at the time. And up next we have Jeff Hardy ends TNA's relationship with New Japan Pro Wrestling. Back in 2011, Jeff Hardy was not in WWE as he was in TNA, but he was far from the top of his game. 2011 was the same year as his infamous TNA Victory Road appearance. In 2011, he was TNA World Champion and TNA had a working relationship with New Japan Pro Wrestling. They sent him over to New Japan to defend his title against rising star Tetsuya Naito at Wrestle Kingdom 5, and sadly, this match was a stinker. This match had so much potential, and it's a shame that it was as messy as it was. It turns out that this match sucked because Hardy took something that he wasn't supposed to before the match and was inebriated throughout. It's been reported that Hardy's poor performance and behavior at Wrestle Kingdom caused New Japan to end their working relationship with TNA. And now we're moving down the iceberg into Tier 2, with our first entry on Tier 2 being Kurt Angle mentions Chris Benoit. In 2013, when Kurt Angle's pill addiction was at its worst and before he went to rehab, in a backstage segment, he was asked about his series of matches with Samoa Joe, and Angle responded by saying that Samoa Joe is one of the toughest opponents that he's ever faced alongside Chris Benoit. From here, the tone of the interview completely changes, as the interviewer's facial expression is filled with surprise at the mention of Benoit. At that point, it had been six years since Chris Benoit committed those atrocious acts, and this is just an example of how the mere mention of his name brings an uneasy feeling. And up next, we have Daphne forced to strip. The lockbox challenge was a spin-off of the Feast of Fired match, and it only took place once in 2010. The eight-woman match would result in four falls, with the winner of each progressing to a briefcase lottery immediately after the match. The prizes were of a slightly different nature from the Feast of Fired match this time, however. The first prize was the TNA Knockouts Championship, the second a contract for any match the winner wishes to have, the third was Tara's pet tarantula, and the fourth was the obligation to strip naked in the ring. The most ridiculous prize is actually the championship belt because it wasn't even vacant at the time. The most unsettling of the prizes in the briefcases though was to strip naked, and Daphne was the one to win that briefcase. Daphne attempted to walk away, but Jeremy Barash grabbed her arm and informed her that she would be fired on the spot if she didn't go to the ring and strip. It was an uncomfortable segment, made even creepier by Orlando Jordan on the ramp oiling himself up. Lacey Von Erich came in and decided that she wanted to strip naked instead, leaving Daphne free to leave the ring. And up next we have Kurt Henning's last match. Kurt Henning's work as Mr. Perfect in the 1980s and early 1990s as part of the WWF are for the most part amazing. 
He had a stint in WCW and returned to WWE, but he got fired in 2002 because of his actions on the plane ride from hell. Following this incident, Kurt Henning would debut in TNA in 2002, looking worse for wear from a physical standpoint, but that didn't stop him from battling names like Jeff Jarrett, R-Truth, and much more. Kurt Henning would wrestle his last match against David Flair on a January 2003 edition of NWA TNA, where the former Mr. Perfect defeated David in an axe on a handle pole match. Sadly, just one month and two days later, Kurt Henning would succumb to his reliance on drugs like coke and painkillers at the age of 44. And up next, we have Dixie Carter employing Vince Russo in secret. Vince Russo was working at TNA in 2011, but was fired for his bad booking and terrible creative ideas. He was replaced by Bruce Pritchard. This made a lot of fans happy, but something seemed strange. As time went on, the TNA show was still littered with Russo-style booking and decisions. So it came as a little surprise in 2014 when wrestling sites accused Russo of still working for TNA. Russo would reject these claims. A few months later, Russo was caught out by accidentally sending an email to PW Insider with instructions for the TNA commentary team. This caused Russo to come clean and admit that he had been working with TNA for some time in a consultant role. During this time, TNA were on rocky grounds with Spike TV and they were desperately negotiating a new TV deal with them. When Spike TV heard about Dixie Carter employing Russo in secret, this was the final nail in the coffin for the TNA Spike TV deal. Spike TV then proceeded to kick TNA off their network and since then TNA have been gravitating to smaller and smaller networks. This incident almost destroyed TNA. And up next we have the Claire Lynch storyline. In one of the worst storylines in TNA history, Bad Influence, Frankie Kazarian and Christopher Daniels had been threatening to dish the dirt on AJ Styles, producing pictures of AJ and TNA president Dixie Carter huddling together. The story was that they helped a friend of Dixie's, Claire Lynch, beat a drug addiction. That quickly moved on to Claire Lynch claiming that she had an affair with AJ. Eventually it came out that she was pregnant and AJ was the father. The following week, Lynch produced a photo of a passed out AJ with her next to him, saying that she took advantage of him. The accusations of AJ cheating on his wife with Lynch was a low storyline that no one enjoyed, but the disgusting segments created a negative reception. The fallout of this was instant and passionate, with the actress playing Claire Lynch quitting the company over it. It was hard for the fans to buy into, as AJ has always been well known as a good Christian and loving husband. And up next we have the Harris Brothers Nazis. Donald and Ronald Harris, the Harris brothers, are American twin brothers best known for their professional wrestling careers with promotions like ECW, WCW, and the WWF. The Harris brothers were Nazi sympathizers though, as they got Nazi tattoos in 1994, but had to get them covered up the following year because of the backlash that they got from the ECW locker room and fans alike. However, that didn't stop them from portraying their affinity for Nazism as in 2002, the brothers appeared on a TNA pay-per-view wearing shirts with the Nazi SS symbol. Viewers were shocked and complained about this, causing TNA to apologize for the incident after the pay-per-view. And up next, we have Chris Jericho. Chris Jericho was contacted multiple times by TNA during his time away from WWE in 2005. The desire to take some time off from wrestling the grueling WWE schedule saw TNA trying to strike since Jericho lived close to the impact zone in Florida. There were rumors of a deal being made when TNA used Jericho's band Fuzzy for one of their pay-per-view theme songs. Jericho even put a TNA graphic on his website to make fans wonder, but he was ultimately trolling. In all actuality, Jericho was just angling for a bigger contract from WWE. WWE had offered him a contract to resign, and he wasn't happy with the money amount, so he went and had a meeting with Jeff Jarrett and Dixie Carter to hear their offer for him, and then he reported it back to WWE, causing them to agree to his contract terms. And up next you have Michael Elgin. Michael Elgin is a Canadian professional wrestler who was best known for his time in New Japan Pro Wrestling where he became a champion there. In 2019, he signed for TNA slash Impact Wrestling, but less than a year into his TNA contract, his name was brought up in the speaking out movement. He was accused by a woman for an incident in 2011 where he allegedly pressured her to fornicate in a hotel room and she refused to do so. He denied all of these claims. He was also accused by another woman of sending an unsolicited picture of his genitals to her. He admitted to this but said that it was just part of a drunken dare by his friends. Impact Wrestling released him from his contract after these allegations surfaced and his life has been on a downward spiral since. His wife has since divorced him and she filed a restraining order against him. He got arrested for violating this restraining order though. He also went missing for a few days but was eventually found. He also got arrested in Japan for trying to steal protein powder from a store. And up next we have Puppet with a Gun. Stevie Lee, best known as Puppet the Psycho Dwarf, was an actor and trained wrestler who made recurring appearances during the early TNA shows where he would engage in matches with fellow little person wrestlers. He was involved in one of the most infamous moments to occur in a wrestling ring for any promotion. 
In July of 2002, Jeff Jarrett came out to the ring carrying a bag with a little person inside and proceeded to beat the little person up before demanding an opportunity at the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship. This then leads to Puppet coming out to the ring to confront Jarrett. He then cuts a promo on Double J and then in a moment that is still shocking today, he pulls out a gun in the middle of the ring, startling everyone in the building and he threatened to kill Double J right then and there. Security tried to get into the ring but couldn't get close to the half pint wrestler because he was threatening to shoot his Glock. Double J managed to subdue Puppet by nailing him with a steel chair. This incident is one of the strangest and most insane things to ever occur in the history of TNA. And up next we have Jesse Sorensen. The 20 year old Jesse Sorensen signed with TNA in 2011 and he definitely seemed like he was one for the future but that all changed in 2012 when Sorensen broke his neck during a match. Despite the broken neck happening on TNA's watch, TNA refused to pay any of Sorensen's medical bills, despite Dixie initially saying that they would take care of his bills. Sorensen looked to sue TNA because of this, but Dixie managed to convince Sorensen not to by giving him a job at TNA as a backstage production assistant. Dixie even promised him that he would have a job at TNA for life on the condition that he could never wrestle again. This placated Sorensen for the moment, but after his contract was up, Dixie sneakily let him go from the company. Dixie clearly took advantage of a naive 20 year old kid who didn't know any better. This whole series of incidents tarnished TNA and Dixie's reputation further at a time where the company was already slipping down. And now we're moving on to the deepest part of the iceberg, Tier 1, with our first entry on Tier 1 being TNA interested in Chris Benoit. Back in 2005, wrestling journalist Dave Malter reported that Chris Benoit's WWE contract was coming up at the end of November. WWE offered him a new contract but the contract was somewhat low. With Chris Benoit and WWE being far apart on money terms, it was possible that Benoit could have become a free agent. Because of this, TNA was interested in Benoit as they would literally try to sign anyone with any name value from WWE that was a free agent. However, about two and a half weeks before Benoit's contract officially expired, his best friend Eddie Guerrero passed away and this absolutely crushed Benoit. It's unclear if this unfortunate incident caused him to re-sign with WWE but he did and he did not end up going to TNA. Many people wonder though if things would have turned out differently if Benoit had joined TNA given he would fit right in there and had a much lighter work schedule than WWE at that time. And up next we have China. China joined WWE in 1997 as she is one of the most prominent women's wrestlers of all time. She left WWE in 2001 though and for close to a decade she left the ring. But seeing her in TNA, not quite in wrestling shape and involved in a lame story, just felt out of place. She was introduced as Kurt Angle's business partner, but weeks before her reveal, she was referred to as his mistress. The two feuded with Jeff and Karen Jarrett. A match between the two teams at Sacrifice had Angle and China coming out on top, but then that left her with nothing else to do. She then unceremoniously disappeared from the company so that she could do an adult film. China had been involved in the adult film industry since 2004 and she had several movies out but she left TNA in 2011 to star in an adult video by Vivid as She-Hulk in their parody of the Avengers. She was also involved in a spin-off feature called She-Hulk Triple X and that released in 2013. Her story ended sadly because in 2016 she was found dead in her home at age 46. Her autopsy revealed that she died of an overdose of alcohol combined with Xanax and painkillers like oxycodone as well as sleeping pills. And up next we have Billy Gunn Blackface. Billy Gunn did blackface for the first time in 1998 when he dressed up as the godfather in the DX Nation of Domination angle. When he was in TNA, they tried to recreate D-Generation X by having the New Age Outlaws try to play the same characters. An outdated act that would see them looking terrible for a few segments that crossed the line for the wrong reasons. But one segment stands out above the rest and this is the segment where Billy Gunn was in blackface. Billy Gunn used blackface for his impression of Devon Dudley in an uncomfortable impersonation of the Dudley Boys. This segment was trashed at the time and it is viewed significantly worse all these years later. And up next we have WWE try to buy TNA in 2016. In 2016, there were reports of unpaid wrestlers and TNA barely having enough money to cover their television tapings. Billy Corgan pumped money into TNA but it wasn't enough and a complete buyout looked inevitable. The off-screen woes persisted in spite of several on-screen improvements but there were reports that TNA were looking to sell their company by October 2nd, 2016 or they wouldn't be able to cover their next set of tapings. This meant that TNA was on the market and WWE were reportedly interested in TNA. The valuation of 4 to 6 million was a drop in the ocean for Vince McMahon and purchasing TNA would have further strengthened WWE's position as the industry dominating monopoly. 
However, the negotiations fell through and WWE did not go through with purchasing the TNA. And up next we have Roddy Piper's Owen Hart promo. You probably aren't aware that WWE Hall of Famer Rowdy Roddy Piper even went to TNA wrestling in his career, but sure enough he did during the early days. In a promo segment involving him and Vince Russo, Piper goes on to call Russo the Osama Bin Laden of wrestling and claim that he was responsible for the end of WCW and Owen Hart's death back in 1999. Owen Hart and Roddy Piper are cousins, so he definitely felt some type of way about Owen Hart's death. Piper continuously grills Russo and it is uncomfortable from beginning to end, with even the crowd getting quiet due to the subject matter. And up next we have Matt Hardy's unaliving note. Matt Hardy's first run in TNA in 2011 was pretty disastrous. It was pretty clear from the get-go that he would be a terrible fit. Hardy had just been on a roller coaster ride of self-destruction for months before being hired. His last few months in WWE were highlighted by his bizarre online behavior and noticeable weight gain. It was clear that something wasn't right in him, and instead of going to rehab, he was hired by TNA. He didn't last long in the company because he continued to make poor decisions and was suspended by the company six months after joining. A release from TNA only seemed like a matter of time, and two months after that, it happened when he was fired after being arrested for a DUI. He didn't take his firing from TNA well though, as the former WWE star posted his goodbyes on Twitter, saying, Goodbye world, my time here is almost complete, I only have a few hours and minutes, I loved you all, regardless of how you felt about me, I'll miss you all. September 23, 1974 to August 31, 2011. Understandably, everybody freaked out and thought that Matt Hardy was about to end his life, but it turns out that this wasn't the intended message that he was trying to overlay to everybody. Instead, it was intended to signal his retirement from wrestling. Fans were upset by this, and Matt Hardy apologized, saying that his intention was poorly executed. And up next, we have Jive talking. Disco Inferno had a short stint in TNA. With his name power and natural charisma, it seemed a logical choice to have him host his own talk show segment on Impact Jive Talking. His first guest was interviewer Goldilocks. For the entire segment, Disco Inferno berated her for being a woman. He then called her a stupid bitch and was demanding that she removed her top to show her breasts as that was all that she was good for. This crossed the line but there were two other episodes that were just as bizarre. All of these segments lasted for 10 minutes at a time and had fake crowd laughter edited in which just added to the cringeness of it. This is some of the worst wrestling television of all time. And up next we have Abyss and Dr. Stevie Richardson. In segments that have been shot to infamy, Abyss had been seeing Dr. Stevie for a few weeks, with Stevie taking a tough love approach. In one of the vignettes, Abyss had turned up at Dr. Stevie's office to retaliate for his friend Lauren being attacked the week before. Dr. Stevie then drugged Abyss's coffee and after a few moments, he made mention of the fact that Abyss had been drugged and was at his mercy. The timing of this was just as the Me Too cases had started hitting the media in the mid-2000s and was a very obvious attempt to latch onto current events, but done in poor taste. And up next we have Puppet pleasuring himself in a trash can. During one of the weekly pay-per-views in 2002, backstage interviewer Goldilocks was seen in the backstage area where she encountered Puppet, the little person wrestler inside of a trash can. At first, things went normally with Goldie interviewing Puppet, but things quickly got weird when some noises could be heard in the trash can of Puppet pleasuring himself. Goldie eventually starts to wonder what the heck is going on before Puppet literally asked her if she wants some porridge, and you don't need to be a genius to know what that means. This segment was truly disturbing. And up next we have Daphne. The wrestling world is no stranger to unsung heroes who lay the foundation for future generations with their hard work, talent and perseverance. One of these unsung heroes was WCW legend Daphne. While many fans are not aware of her contributions to the wrestling industry, she was an important fixture for WCW and TNA. However, in TNA, she suffered many, many concussions. The safety of wrestlers in TNA became a huge issue when Daphne suffered a career-ending concussion and received no support from the company. This concussion would see Daphne not cleared to wrestle and the company coldly released her without helping any of her medical expenses and Daphne was never able to wrestle again. And in September of 2021, Daphne streamed a live video through Instagram in which she read an unaliving note, holding what appeared to be a pistol and requested that her brain be donated for CTE testing. Concerned fans took to social media to support Daphne and law enforcement was dispatched to her address. Law enforcement found her dead from a self-inflicted gunshot to the chest. Her death was ruled as a self-deletion. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our other videos and also please like, share, comment, and subscribe. But anyway, goodbye.